Money and credit dominate everyday life in capitalist society. People need money to obtain housing, medicine, education, pension rights and insurance, and they often have to borrow it. Access to money and credit is the most powerful lever of social stratification. The very rich inhabit a separate world of provision, including food and entertainment. Social disparities have become vast and are based on access to finance rather than on birth, religious beliefs, high office or intellectual power. Money and credit also shape the process of democracy by influencing electoral representation. They determine cultural trends by dominating the arts. They mold morality by valuing human relations in terms of pennies and pounds, buying you social standing, personal sophistication, individual erudition, even fine feelings. They are the measure of human worth, the quintessence of social success. A world after capitalism would transform money and credit from external forces that shape the lives of individuals into instruments that serve people. Two important steps would reduce the power of money. First, there would be expanded public provision of key goods and services. Think housing, education, health, transport, pensions and insurance, making these available to all as a right. Second, there would be growth of the new commons through the internet, making information, the media, music and other goods practically free at the point of consumption. Creative interpersonal relations would flourish, giving greater depth to the arts. Greater fairness and equality would go together with greater popular participation in literature, music, theatre and all the things that add colour to human existence. There is nothing unrealistic about this prospect, and indeed elements of it already exist in capitalist society. Think state welfare provision in health. Think costless access to goods and services through the internet. A new society would develop and coordinate these associational and communal practices while ensuring democratic accountability. Money would become mostly a practical means of keeping accounts and delivering goods and services to people across society. At the same time, money would offer the opportunity to exercise choice once basic needs were covered by obtaining goods such as clothing, food, holidays and so on from the private sector. Credit could similarly be reduced to a practical and subsidiary role in individual life. There would be public banks offering a secure outlet for saving while public pension schemes could allow choice on the proportion of income set aside for retirement. Modern banks already possess databases and statistical techniques to assess and evaluate the credit worthiness of huge numbers of individuals. But they deploy these to make speculative loans. Adopting this model led directly to the gigantic crisis we are currently going through. An alternative society would take over these methods using them to smooth consumption according to choice and without speculation. Reducing the power of money and credit would eliminate the poisonous role they now play in social, political, moral and ethical matters. The intrinsic merits and qualities of individuals would have more scope to act as true means of distinction. Culture and the arts would be rid of the oppression of monetary wealth. Interpersonal relations would be freed of monetary calculations. The democratic process and the accountability of public office would be improved. With money and credit under control, society would gain a profound freedom.